Thanks everyone for coming today. It's been, a, it's a, as Andrew mentioned, it's been a pretty tough day. Uh, it is a tough day at the Vancouver Aquarium, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, so, but for my talk anyway. Um, okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is provide a fairly quick update on, uh, however, um, Andrew <laughs> told me yesterday there's a little bit more time, so it, it'll be a little bit longer than I was originally intending, to talk about, uh, to update uh, you on our, uh, on our whale photogrammetry project. Uh, this is a, a project that I've been involved in for a few years, pr principally with, uh, with colleagues John Durbin and Holly Fernback at the uh, Southwest uh, Fishery Center in, um, in San Diego. Um, the work, the... Uh, the study, this, this aerial photogrammetry study, this uh, way of measuring uh, particularly killer whales from the air, from aerial photographs taken with a drone, uh, was something that John and, and Holly developed uh, in the, uh, in the uh, prior to 2010, really 2007, 2008, um, using manned helicopters. Um, it was very expensive, but it was the, the, uh, the technique seemed to be very strong. And then uh, there, there was a, um, a bilateral uh, a panel convened and a series of workshops run um, uh, around 2000, uh, 2010 to, or 2011, 2012 to look at the uh, potential impact of salmon fisheries on southern resident killer whales in particular. And uh, it was a very interesting uh, a series of, of four workshops altogether. And one of the conclusions of the workshop was that the panel, the scientific panel that sort of deliberated almost like a, like a jury situation, to, uh, to, to, to scientists, managers, and managers, and uh, uh, both marine mammal managers and, and fisheries managers uh, making their case. The panel recommended that, or believed, reported that uh, it thought that, that uh, photogrammetry, this way of measuring the body shape and, and inferring the body condition of, of killer whales, provided the, uh, the, the, was likely to yield the greatest uh, sort of amount of new scientific information to shed on this question of how uh, specifically, how killer whale populations and killer whale individuals are effect, affected by fluctuations in their in their prey supply. So, armed with this recommendation from the panel, uh, John and Holly and I struck up a little uh, coalition and and um, and started a project to do this work uh, using using drones as opposed to manned helicopters because they were because they were uh, so much more affordable, and they they turned out to have a number of other advantages too. They were much quieter and much less invasive, really. Than Photographing from a helicopter, um, the uh, of course uh, individual variation in a bunch of killer whales. Like as you see in this picture, there's an, a really thin whale up the top, a sort of robust average animal of average condition in the middle, and a pregnant female at the bottom. Um, this uh, lots of things can affect body condition, and not not just prey limitation. And these would be things like dis like, like disease, for example, like age. We find that lactating females tend to be consistently a bit skinnier than and other females, not surprisingly, lactation is really expensive. Um, and so part of the challenge uh, is to sort of tease out um, this, uh, uh, this, this individual variation from, from sort of group variation that's likely to, to result from food effect. Killer whales share their food pretty compulsively, as Gray Mellis showed years ago now. So we think that when prey are limiting, that, that sort of prey shortage, shortage is likely to be more or less averaged over a group of killer whales. Um, so, thin group is much more likely to be indicative of, of, a, of, a, of a lack of food than a, than a single thin individual, but very simply. Um, I'm not going to talk about this much, but of course part of the, uh, the intent of this uh, project is to eventually to link this better understanding of the relationship between, between food availability, prey abundance if you like, and, uh, and killer whale body condition to uh, to fisheries management, and uh, uh, the basic logic is outlined here, really. Um, I can talk about that a little bit more in question, the question period if you'd like, but this is certainly where we're, our intent is, and our hope is that this is where the project will go, that this is a, really a study that we're looking at as, as, as an applied study. I'm going to talk about, I have a few slides to talk about uh, pregnancy. It, it turns out that we can, as you can see from a couple of slides ago, it's when you know, females that are, that are highly gravid, uh, are pretty easy to, to detect um, in an aerial photo. Um, we had the opportunity, John and Holly really before, as you know, in the early stages of my involvement with the project, did some work at, uh, at SeaWorld in San Diego with a young 
pregnant female named Callia, and they, uh, they were able to document using exactly the same kind of vertical photograph taken from a vertical perspective, changes in her shape and girth um, throughout the entire course of her pregnancy. They started a photogrammetry, a little photogrammetry study there bef before uh, she was even known to be pregnant. Um, and what they found was that, um, uh, that as, as you might expect, the, uh, the width profile, or the distribution of, of, of body mass, I guess, changed as, uh, through the course of Callie's pregnancy. So that, you know, initially uh, the, uh, the point of maximum girth tends to be around the base of their ribs. Um, and as, uh, and as, as pregnancy progresses, they get fatter down below. So, I mean, we know what this is like. It's the same, same with people. Um, and uh, so, so it's not just, it's just the fatness of a whale that tells you uh, that they're pregnant. It's where that shape is, you know, how that shape is distributed. Um, so, uh, you know, here's... Uh, uh, L91 uh, a week prior to to giving birth, and then uh, and then after uh, uh, her calf was born, um, and you can see that that uh, bit of you know that she's hasn't completely gone back to her her sort of pre gestation shape, but she's her her shape uh, in the right hand side of this picture with, when she's showing with the calf is is, uh, is is much less pear shaped than on the in the left part. Um, Oh, okay. J-17 was a tank. Um, you know, <laughs> you can see she just wanted to have that calf so badly. Um, but, you know, this is, you didn't really have to do any science to be able to tell that, that she was pregnant. Um, here's a bunch of calves. Um, we're also looking at growth rates. Uh, it's, it's easy to measure uh, length in these uh, aerial photos. Um, interestingly, of these calves uh, in the southern resident community, um, born in, in, uh, in 2015, you can see that... Uh, J50 is the uh, is the smallest, uh, and is also the oldest. Was the oldest when each one of these photos was taken, and she's the only female in this crop. And, and uh, it does seem that females are a bit. You know, we know we've known for many years there's sexual dimorphism that as adults females are, don't get as long as, as males, about a meter shorter on average. And uh, and uh, but but that size difference seems to seems to begin at, at a fairly early stage, although it's pretty subtle to start with. Um, a couple of, uh, just to throw in some northern residents here, a couple of, uh, of pics of, taken this summer of, uh, of pregnant uh, northern resident uh, females. Um, this is a picture of K27 um, carrying a fetus um, in, the, in May of this year, of 2016. We, uh, we took this photo and didn't even realize at the time that, it was, that she was carrying around a a fetus, we thought it was a fish, and when we looked at the pictures that evening um, after taking this photo, we realized that in fact she'd had a, you know, a sort of fairly late-term um, miscarriage. And uh, one of the things that's, one of the reasons I guess we're so interested in being able to detect pregnancy from the air is that we, th we there are multiple lines of evidence going back quite a long way uh, that that killer whales likely um, lose a lot of calves, um, either in, as uh, sort of late-term miscarriages or as neonate mortality. Um, so in tough years, it, it may be that it's not a problem for females getting pregnant, but it's, a, it's, a, it's difficult for the, them to carry the, those calves full term. Um, the, uh, so as far as this project um, goes, we, we started uh, more or less as a pilot study in Johnson Strait in 2014. We, we've done two, Johnson Strait again in 2015 and 2016 at the same time of year so that we can look on, uh, so we have some, some consistency, we can tang, untangle seasonal effects. We started southern resident killer whales in September of 2015 based on Salmon Island, working mostly in Harrow Strait. Um, and then we did that again in May of 2016 and September of 2016. So with southern residents, we're putting a bit more effort in, and we're trying to look at within-season effects as well as between-season effects. It would be great to do that with northern residents too, but uh, um, you know, our, our time and funding is a bit limited. We're also, we're focused, the study's really focused on resident killer whales, but we're also doing big killer whales opportunistically. Um, I didn't... Uh, Oh yeah, humpbacks. <laughs> I, I didn't put a picture of bigs, if any bigs, in from the air because that, you know, that's sort of a half-hour discussion. They're really cool. They're so different. They're big, jowly heads. They're like sculpins from the air. 
And every single big killer whales we've looked at since 2014 has been fat. They're, they're, doing, uh, they're doing really well. <laughs> um, so yes, in 2016, we, we started uh, working on humpbacks a little bit as well. Our, our primary focus is on killer whales, but um, uh, you know, humpbacks are very interesting uh, as well. And of course, you know, we expect big, big seasonal conditions in, in humpbacks because, uh, because they migrate and spend most animals and spend some time of the year in relatively unproductive uh, uh, calving grounds where they're not feeding much at all. Um, I just uh, threw up a few, a few pictures of some of the well-known facts from the northern Vancouver Island area, and Jackie is, is not in the audience, I don't think. No. Oh, well, ja Jackie Hildering, uh, Christy McMillan uh, really helped a lot with the, uh, and Jared Towers, uh, with the uh, with the humpback work that we've, do, we've been doing, we've been using their catalog to, uh, to, uh, uh, to match all of our humpback whale photos from the air. Humpbacks are really easy compared to killer whales for this kind of thing. Um, here's Slash, those of you who spend any time up there are familiar with this whale. Um, there's her calf. Um, Maud is a, is a really big um, humpback female that's been coming to that area uh, for, for many years, 1993, and uh, she has a, a, had a calf this year, 28 feet long already for calves, pretty big. Um, and here's some miscellaneous photos of some of the humpbacks. I threw this up because you can see the variation in body condition, and you can see Jackie's in good condition down there as well. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to show this little video. We're also, we've also been doing, do we have some audio, Rob, by any chance? That's not super important. Um, we also got a permit at the last minute to do, to do humpback whale blow sampling, where we're flying the drone through the the, uh, the blow of humpbacks to obtain whales, not basically to, um, <laughs> and, and that is being used in two studies, one by our, our, our friendly local pet uh, um, veterinary pathologist, Stephen Rafferty, who's, uh, who's really interested in what, healthy, what kinds of organisms healthy whales have in their, in their blow. And, uh, um, and, some, and we're splitting the samples, and some of it's going to Stephen, I mean to Michael Moore at Woods Hole Institute, who's looking at microbiome communities of microorganisms in the respiratory tracts of humpback whales. If you could hear the, um, the audio here, you'd hear the way we do the drone work is that John, John does the flying, and Holly sits there looking at a screen telling him what to do, so she's saying, back, 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 forward, 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 and he's saying, slow down, and uh, it's always dialogue. Uh, I just drive the boat and listen to conversations. Um, and, uh, but anyway, this has been uh, quite successful too. We're, we're, um, the humpbacks don't, we haven't been able to detect any uh, reaction on their part. We don't, we don't have any reason to think that they even recognize the, the drone as something other than, you know, as something interesting. Um, they have, of course, when they're feeding, there are often lots of birds around them, and so they're presumably used to flying objects. And we, we have a, uh, you could sort of see maybe a little bit of a frame on the front of the drone. In theory, the, drone, the, the blow comes up and coats that, and we, and we throw it in a, in a bag it up and label it and put it in a, mine, in a liquid nitrogen doer. In actual fact, the drone ends up all slimy and rusty, and we, and we, uh, <laughs> we swab it down and sterilize it, and we get lots of, uh, lots of blows. So we didn't invent this method. Michael's been using it for a couple of years. Others have been using it in, in a study in Australia, but it is, uh, it's, it's, it's an effective technique. Thank you very much. Thank you.